Hello, this is Hana Jeremiah uh, Lesson 11 The Covenant Let's go to read The read for this week's study Genesis 9, 1-17 through 17, and 12, 1-3 through 3, Galatians 3, 6-9 through 9, uh, 15 through 18 um, uh, Exodus 24, Jeremiah 31 31 through 34, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 24 through 26. Memory text, the days are coming, coming declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. Jeremiah 31, 31. Although the Bible speaks of covenants, in the plural, Romans chapter 9, 4, Galatians chapter 4, 24, there is only one basic covenant, the covenant of grace, in which God bestows salvation upon fallen beings who claim it by faith. The idea of plural covenants arises from the various ways of God has restated the essential covenant promise in order to meet the needs of his people in different times and settings. But whether it's the Adamic covenant, Genesis chapter 3.15, the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3, Galatians chapter 3, 6 through 9, the Sinai, Sin Synetic, synetic or synetic covenant, Exodus 22, um, the Davidic, Davidic, Davidic covenant, Ezekiel 37, 24 through 27, or the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. The idea is the same. The salvation God provides is a gift unmerited, unmerited and undeserved, and the human response to that gift. In a sense, humanity is holding up its side of the, uh, its side of the deer, its faithfulness and obedience. The first mention of the new covenant is in Jeremiah. In the context of Israel's return from exile and the blessings that God would grant them. Even amid the calamity and trouble, the Lord extends to His wayward people the, the offer of hope and restoration. Sunday, God's covenant with our humanity. We look at bad the world is today, that is, we see all the evil in it. And yet, God still bears with us. Thus, we can only imagine just how bad things must have been in order for the Lord to destroy the whole world with a flood. God had given man his covenant uh, commandments as a rule of life, but his law was transgressed and every conceivable sin was the result. The wickedness of man was open and the daring justice was trampled in the dust. And the cries of the oppressed reached unto heaven. Landy White, Patri Patriarchs and the Prophets, page 91. Read Genesis 9, chapter, uh, chapter 9, 1 through 17. What covenant was made between God and humanity, and how does it reflect God's grace toward the creation? The covenant God expressed to Noah was the most universal among the biblical covenants. It was with our humanity, and it included, included the, the animals and nature too. Yeah, Genesis 9:12. Also, this was a one-sided arrangement. The Lord didn't impose any require, 
requirements or stipulated stipulations upon those with whom he was establishing the covenant. He simply was not going to destroy the earth with water again, period. Unlike other covenants, nothing was conditional about it. God then sealed, 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 sealed his covenant with a visible sign, that of a rainbow, which symbolizes the covenant promise that the earth will never be destroyed by a flood again. So anytime we see a rainbow, the mere fact that we are here to see this in its own way, a uh, vindication of this ancient covenant promise. After all, if we had been wiped out in a universal flood, we wouldn't be here to see the rainbow amid the constant sin and evil here on earth. At times, we are blessed with the beauty of the rainbow, a sign of God's grace toward the whole world. We can look up at it and draw, draw hope, not only hope, from just how beautiful it is in and of itself, but also because we know that it's message from God, a message of His love toward our wretched planet. There are lots of things, um, just to think about that, the water and gas, the air, the yeah, God's, anyway, the, do, do not want to destroy by water plot or with a rainbow promise. But the next, God told terrors through the Bible, the next time fire the with kind of elements, the gas. Yeah, we think about that. Dwell upon the grandeur and beauty of a rainbow, especially in light of what the Bible tells us about the rainbow. In what ways can it draw us toward God, toward trans transcendence, transcendence toward something gra greater than what this mere earth itself off offers, offers? Monday. The covenant with Abraham, Genesis 12, 1 through 3, 15, 1 through 5, 17, 1 through 14. What do these texts tell us about what the Lord intended to do through the covenant he made with Abraham? The Abrahamic uh, covenant of grace is fundamental to the entire course of salvation history. That's why Paul used it to help explain the plan of salvation as it was fulfilled in Jesus himself. Galatians uh, chapter 3, 3, 6, 9, 15 through 18. How does Paul con contact, connect the covenant made with Abraham to Jesus and to salvation by faith alone? Through Abraham's seed, referring not to his many descendants, but in particular to one, Jesus, see Galatians 3.16, God would bless the entire world, all who would be a part of Abraham's seed, which happens by faith in Christ, um, uh, would happens by faith in Christ, Galatians 3.29, uh, would find that Abraham's God would be their God as well. Even back then, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Galatians chapter 3, 6. Abraham was no more saved by work than the thief on the cross was. It's always an only God-saving grace uh, that brings salvation. Abraham fulfilled uh, his end of the covenant promise. His obedience revealed the faith that took hold of the promise of salvation. His works didn't justify him. Instead, the works showed that he was already justified. That's the essence of the 
covenant and how it is expressed in the life of faith. See Romans chapter 4, 1 through 3. Dwell upon the great truth that your hope of salvation comes only from the righteousness of Jesus credited to you by faith. What great hope and great hope and joy can you dra- derive from this wonderful provision made in your belief? The uh, Tuesday, the covenant at Sinai. Uh, how was the covenant made between Israel and God at Mount Sinai? Exodus 24. Moses and uh, some leaders went to Mount Sinai. These leaders included Aaron and his two sons who represented the priests and the seventh elders and leaders who represented the nation. The men accompanying Moses had to stop from afar, but Moses was allowed it to go up to where God appeared. Moses later returned and affirmed the covenant with the whole nation. He proclaimed that well, he proclaimed what God had spoken to him, to which the nation answered with the following words: "All the words which the Lord has said, we will do." See Exodus 24, 3. Of course, as sacred history has shown and as our own experience often, often proves, it's one thing to make the claim to be obedient. It's quiet another to reach out in faith and surrender in order to harness, harness the divine power that gives us the grace to do what we say will. Uh, read Hebrews chapter 4 2. What does this verse say about Israel's failure? How can we learn to avoid the same mistake? Only, to, uh, w- only by faith and by grasping the promises that come by faith can we be obedient. An obedience that is expressed by loyalty to God's law. Obedience to the law was no more contrary to the everlasting covenant in Moses' time than it is in ours. The common misperception about the law and the covenants which usually arises from reading poor stems uh, stems from a failure to take into account the context in which Paul was written, writing that of dealing with his Judaizing opponents. They wanted to make the law and obedience to it central to the faith. Paul, in contrast, wanted to make Christ and his righteousness the central component. How often have you said all that the Lord has told me? I will do only to fail to follow through. Only fail to follow through. How does this un- unfortunate reality reality make the promise of grace so much more precious? What what hope would you have without it? No. And Wednesday, the New Covenant, Part 1, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. What do these texts mean both in their immediate context in ours today? Jeremiah uttered these words amid the greatest Christ the people had yet faced the coming Babylonian invasion when the nation was threatened with all but certain extinction here again, however, as in other places, the Lord offered them hope, the promise that this was not going to be the ultimate end, and that they would have another chance to 
thrive in the presence of the Lord. So the first promise of the new covenant found in the Bible is in the context of Israel's eventual return from Babylonian exile and the blessing that God would grant to them upon that return, just as the breaking of the covenant made at Sinai, Jeremiah 31-32, brought them into exile of 